welcome in the Lord's name, particularly as we gather today around his table where young and old, whoever you are, you are welcome. We're going to start by singing of that. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you here. And I want to encourage you, the actions for this are quite simple, but I'll remind you. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you here. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you here and then gathering in this place when we get to that part of it. So let's start off. It doesn't start off with that because that's when I get it wrong. But let's start off and sing this as we welcome each other. song um, was written by a, a Christian musician called Stephen Fishbacker, and it was written that it could be used both in churches and in schools to welcome folk. The interesting thing with the song, though, is it isn't explicitly a Christian song. It's taking a Christian ethos because we welcome in Jesus' name, and it's saying actually that applies to the whole of society, but it has a particular understanding for Christians because it comes out of that Christian tradition where we really do believe that everyone is welcome, not just because it's good to see them, but because actually at the heart of our worship is Jesus who came and welcomed every single person. And it welcomed people whatever they'd done, whether they deserve to be welcomed or deserve to be shown the door. Everybody included. And that's because Jesus' love, His grace, is unconditional. And we come as Christians as those that God has welcomed, God has invited, even though we are not worthy. So we're going to sing just now a song which is most definitely Christian, and it is the words of amazing grace that just remind us that we are welcomed here, not because we're super spiritual, or because we're religious, or because we're great people, but because Jesus died for us, and that changes everything. So let's sing together, My Chains Fell Off, Amazing Grace.
Unending love, amazing grace. Father, we come this morning and we thank you for that welcome that you give us in Jesus. We thank you that that welcome comes to us despite the fact that you know exactly who we are. All our fears and our doubts and our questions, all our feelings, and sometimes even those deep shameful things that we want no one else to know. We come and we look at Jesus and we see Him and we come aware of all the things that we fail in. And yet your unending love, your amazing grace meets us. And so as we come asking for forgiveness, we know that you meet us with it because of Jesus. And so today, we ask that you would help us to worship aware that we are not worthy, but reveling in your grace that invites us to come and be in the presence of our Lord, even as we pray together the words that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Sometimes, Sometimes, ministers repeat themselves. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. Sometimes, ministers repeat themselves. You have noticed it now. I'm going to do a, a, a little talk I've done many times before, and some of you have seen it, but I, I do it without any apology because it, it really brings us back to reminding ourselves why we're here. Now, it's got some things that are going to do some stuff at the front. So if any of you can't see and you want to come round, because I'm going to be working with some chemicals and some things that do amazing things. So if you can't see, feel free. Even, even the adults, you feel free to, to move around because it's all going to happen here. Um, hopefully. Hopefully, because sometimes these things go wrong. Um, just have a seat on the steps. You're fine there. Um, don't get too close to this because um, it's not magic. It's got some chemicals in it and it's a bit smelly. <sighs> you know, one of the things that we do as we come to worship is we think about ourselves. 
Do you ever come to church and feel they're talking about all the bad things we do and I don't really want to be reminded of that? Anyone feel like that sometimes? Because I do. It's just me. You lot are all perfect. But, you know, that's part of what we do when we come. We remind ourselves that God made us, and God made us to be people who are good and loving, and there's nothing wrong with us when He made us. That's how He intended us to be. And He made for us a world that was good. In fact, in the beginning of the Bible, it tells us that when God made the world and He looked at it all, He said, it's good. It's good. That's just water. But you know, it didn't stay that way, did it? Because we do things that are not good, and uh, I'm not going to use that. Can you think of some of the things that we do that are not good? Anybody? No. No. Don't contemplate these. It's something you do. Cheeky to your parents. Right, okay, well, a wee bit of cheek might be all right, but there is a point that we actually are quite nasty to each other. Is anyone ever nasty to folk in their household that they love? Parents, are you ever nasty to your children? Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes, and it's, it's not good, and it's like a wee bit of a, you know, it messes up our lives and our relationships, and sometimes it's even worse than a bit nasty. Sometimes we're downright mean. And sometimes we see uncaring things. Can you think of anything else that happens that messes stuff up, messes our lives up? Anything else? Lying. Lying, yeah. Yeah, lying. Lying all the time. We tell lies. And not just we tell lies. Our whole society tells lies. Politicians tell lies. All sorts of things that are not true. And again, it just messes up life a little bit. We could go on from there as well, because it's not just the ways that we, we treat each other. What about the ways we treat the world around us? Yeah? What are you thinking of? Okay. Yeah, swearing, bad talking. Yep, that's another thing that messes life up. Anything else? Sorry? Oh, yep, yeah, pollution and not caring for the planet, we could add that on, or we could add on things like not caring for the poor, being greedy. How many of us just enjoy stuff and never think about the people that we don't share with? And eventually, you know, our lives end up being a bit of a mess, a bit of a mess. And sometimes when we come to church, one of the things we do is we think about Jesus and his love and we... Uh, we think about God and the way that He wanted us to be, we can end up feeling, actually, I'm pretending my life's nice, but I know it's not. I know it's like that. And sometimes what we think is that if we just try a little bit harder, we can make things better. So I'm going to try to wash this and make it nice again. Let's see what happens. There we are. And did that make things better? Yeah, it's nice and clean now. I've washed it. Yeah? No? And, and sometimes that's a little bit like what we do. We, we think if, if, I, if, I, if I do all the right things and I try really hard and I turn over a new leaf and, and I give some money away, you know, I can make the world a better place. And actually, our lives just get worse because we fill it with guilt and with the things we've promised to do to make things better. How many of you have made resolutions at some point? I'm going to start doing and I'm going to volunteer at and I'm going to make time for and you've broken it. And it's not just that. You see, the problem with all these things that we're doing in our lives is that it has an impact not just on our lives but on the world around us that God made, doesn't it? We can think of pollution, but as we look at all the things that are wrong in the world, the wars and the fighting and the injustice, they're all caused by lots of people like us doing our own little bit. 
But that's where our Christian faith starts. It's not where it ends. As we come to church, we are coming that we might not come and think we're holy, good people. Sometimes people that are religious and go to church think, I'm better than everybody else because I go to church. But actually, if we're listening to Jesus and looking at his love, we are aware we are not better. We are more aware of the way we've failed. But this is a risky bit. Because the good news of the gospel is that God sent his son to die on a cross for us. He sent his love into the world because he didn't want to leave us with all the mess. He wanted us made new and forgiven. And this water here, I've added something to it. A bit like God added his son. Now, what Jesus did worked. We'll have to see whether this works. Because what it is, is that as we come to the Lord Jesus with all that's wrong, and we say to him, please forgive me. Let's see, this is a bit risky because this might not work. But as we come to him and we ask for his forgiveness, he takes our rotten lives and he begins to work on them. First of all, he forgives us. And then he begins to change us. And look, it worked. But when Jesus does it, it always works. It's not that we suddenly become perfect people, but he looks on us and he says, because of what Jesus did, you are forgiven. And when God looks at you, despite all your sin and your brokenness, he looks at you as if you were completely, completely without sin. And he loves you. But you know, that's not where it stops because the gospel isn't just about Christians coming and being forgiven, that they can be in a relationship with God. It's also to make a difference in the world around us. And this is the bit that I love because we're put back into this messy world that as we go in the Spirit of God into a broken world, we might make a difference too. And the world around us can start to become the place that God intended it to be. And that's as we feed the hungry, as we speak out for injustice, as we share God's love with people that tells them that they are loved and that this gospel is for them as well. It can begin to change the world around us too. That is the gospel. Now, as I say, I've used that before, and some of you are going, I've seen that. But, you know, one of the things about ministers repeating themselves is it's important because we actually need to remember again and again and again what God has done for us, that we might marvel and we might worship and we might know that we are loved and forgiven and called as Christians to change the world around us. Tell me the old, old story, as that song says. Let's pray. Father, we come to communion today, which is for all ages and all people, which reminds us that Jesus died for us. We are reminded of our brokenness and our sinfulness and our feelings, but also of your forgiving love in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to remember that today and rejoice in it today, not because we do better things, but because you did an amazing thing for us in your grace. Amen. And we're going to sing now, and we're going to sing, Blessed be the name of the Lord. It worked. I'm impressed. I didn't...
junior church are going to, to leave us just now. The announcements this morning are, are really all on the sheet. I would just draw your attention to um, the announcement with sadness of the, the death of two of our members, Betty Morton and Margaret Reed. And the, our prayers and thoughts are with their families at this time. continue this morning reading God's Word, and we, we're um, working through the Gospel of Mark, and Edith, Edith is going to come and read from Mark chapter 7 for us. Oh, there you are. The reading today is from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. And it's entitled, Jesus Honours a Syrophoenician Woman's Faith. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. 
She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Amen. Thanks, Edith. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word to reflect on it from the gospel, we pray, Lord, that as we hear the old story, so it would become new again for us. Amen. If I can have the... Oh, we got it. Question. Difficult question. Have to think about this. Is it ever okay to call a woman a dog? Now, if you hesitate on that one, we'll have a wee word later. But I, I, I don't know. Well, maybe, maybe just about we could justify it. You know, if it was like my little chihuahua or something really cute, you know, it might be an okay comparison, just about a bit weird really, but you might get away with it if it was that sort of really cute dog. But one of the things, if you, if you read anything of the Bible, is you know the, the, the Bible writers are not really thinking of our domestic little puppies when they, when they think of dogs. In fact, the word, when, it, when it's used in the Bible, Old and New Testament, is actually thinking of something quite different. It's thinking of that dangerous scavenger, that manging, minging cur. And so calling someone a dog isn't the chihuahua, it's much more like saying bitch. It's actually hurtful, antagonistic language, demeaning. In fact, the term that was often used by Jews at that time as they spoke about non-Jews was Gentile dog. And the idea was that you were unclean. And used in the context of this Syrophoenician woman, it was something to do with who she was and where she came from. She was one of Israel's natural historic enemies. Someone from Sire and Tyre and Sidon, the lands up north, pagans that worshipped other gods and had for years been the traditional enemies of Israel. That's the background to what Jesus does when he's talking about a dog. I'm going to come back to that because the minute you begin to read something in the gospel that doesn't seem to fit, it should cause us to ask some questions. What's going on here? But before we do that, just let's go into this passage a, a little bit because one of the things we've been doing as we've been reading through Mark's gospel, and we're not looking at every part of Mark, but we are going to go through it seamlessly up until Easter time. And I, I, I was saying to you, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up because that's when I find out how many Christians lie. Um, I was saying to you, try to take the time to read Mark's gospel. It's only about 15 chapters. You can read the whole thing through in probably about an hour. Very short. Read it a few times. Because one of the things that's, that's a bit of a problem with sermons is that we tend to take a little passage and go over it and over it and over it, and we miss the fact that this is part of a book. It's a story. Um, and, and it all fits together. And for instance, in this passage, it begins by saying um, that he left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. Now, you can just ignore that, but actually, that's giving us quite a lot of information, where he was before and where he was going. What's the context of this? Well, he's been around the shores of Galilee in the last parts of the last couple of chapters which is home territory for Jesus. It's in and out the little villages of Nazareth and Capernaum and Cana and all these places where Jesus spends an awful lot of his time, where, where Peter and Simon and the others um, grew up. And that's where he is. And in that place, he's, he, the crowds are coming. And we've seen the crowds coming in previous chapters, they, they, particularly for his healing. They were bringing everybody to him to the level of, of it was almost getting too much at times. And in the passage before, in fact, he'd been teaching on the shores of Galilee and a huge big crowd had come. And at the end of him teaching, they wanted more and more and more. I, I really wish that people did this for, for sermons today, but they just kept wanting more. Tell us more, Jesus. Tell us more until the disciples said, Jesus, it's getting late and we're getting hungry. We've been here all day. These guys are going to be hungry too and it's the middle of nowhere. Tell them to go home. And the Bible tells us that Jesus had such compassion on them that he challenged the disciples about finding some food for them. And then he fed the 5,000 people. And after that, he walked on water. And after that, 
he had a big fight with the Pharisees and the opponents and the, the, the opposition that was beginning to rise. It was very hectic. And what Jesus does at the beginning of this passage is it says, he left that place. Now, that's not unimportant either because Jesus often leaves. He leaves where the demand is. He leaves where the ministry is going on and he takes himself out. Now, you might think that's not what you'd expect of Jesus. If there's need and there's hungry people and there's folk needing healed, he'd be right there all the time in the middle of it, do more and more and more and more and more. That's how sometimes we think Christians should be. There's more to be done. Active, active, active. But actually, the Bible will, at numbers of points, tell us that Jesus comes away out. And he needs time to be with his Father, time to reflect, time to look for God's power. And if Jesus, the Son of God, needed that, how much more do we need that? The Christian life is not all about do, do, do. Sometimes the church gives a wrong impression. Come to a meeting, join a committee, do, do, go on a rota. But actually the call that's just as important is spend time with the Lord. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is where he goes. Um, I'm going to show you a wee map. Maps are always good. Um, don't worry, you can't see all the details, but on the, on, on the map, on the, the left, you get the idea that there's the, the River Jordan. Jesus is ministering most of Mark's gospel around the shores of Galilee, the lake in the north. There is um, Nazareth, if you've got good eyesight, and Capernaum, and, and, and the different places around there. Tyre is right up in the north. So when he says he left that place, it's not just that he sort of went to the next town. He's actually left, thanks Colin, th he's actually left the Holy Land. He's gone right out of the land of Israel. So this isn't just, you know, a, he sort of like before we saw, he sort of crossed over the water and it was maybe an afternoon's wee boat trip. This is several days journey right out of the land of Israel to a place called Tyre. Serious time out. And interestingly, in the book of Kings, we find the prophet Elijah doing the same thing. Elijah's engaged in a different type of ministry. He's gone to the king of Israel, and he's, he's, he's rebuking the king of Israel, and he's told them there's going to be a drought. And then God takes Elijah up to the same region, Tyre and Sidon, two cities, out of Israel. And there, Elijah actually um, is taken to a place where a woman, a lot of women in this story, comes to him, or rather he goes to her, and he says, God has told me that you'll feed me, so will you make me some food? Typical guy, isn't it? Where's the food? And the woman says, I've got only enough to feed my child, and then we're going to starve. And Elijah says, give the children, child's food to me, and there will be enough. And she just has those crumbs, and yet out of those crumbs, the food and the oil keep coming, because God keeps supplying. So there's a little parallel going on in this passage to that passage in the Old Testament of God who keeps providing. Tyre is a pagan city. And there's more to it than just that because as I was reading about this, I, I was reading that one of the things that was going on is that there was a sense among the Jews of Galilee that these pagan cities sucked all their food. Galilee was a number of villages. It was a very poor area. They were subsistence farmers on little plots of land and a wee bit of fishing. And what often happened in rural poor areas is that the big rich guys in the city were literally sucking the resources out. And so sometimes the children of Israel were going hungry because the taxes and the Jews and the rents were all going to the big city with the rich people there. So when Jesus talks about taking the children's food, 
there's maybe a little bit of that going in, you can begin to see some of the antagonism that's going on between the Israelites and these oppressors. And it's in that context that this woman comes to Jesus. Her little girl is, is sick. But as she comes to Jesus, she must be aware of a number of things. First of all, that he's a Jewish prophet and she's a pagan. She doesn't worship his God. She worships lots of gods. She must be aware that she's part of a race and a people and a city culture that are seen not just as being people beyond the pale, but as people who are seen as their oppressors. She must realize that the Jewish people have no reason to like them at all or give them anything. And yet she comes to Jesus shamelessly. In fact, the Bible says that she begged him to help her daughter. And that word that's used for begged isn't just that she came and said, would you do it, please? It really means she begged him, begged, and went on begging. Now, those of you who are parents will know there is nothing more shameless than a parent who needs something for their children. Do you? You know, if, if it's about something I needed, I would have my dignity. I'm not going to ask, and I'm not going to, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I'm too proud. You get what I mean? But if my children are hungry, or my children need, I'm going to go to whatever it takes to provide. And that's what this mother is doing here. She doesn't get in our high horses about, oh, you can't treat me like that, you can't talk to me like that. She just needs it for her children. And she is willing to beg for what she requires at this point. There is no dignity here. And in one sense, this is actually a model of how prayer should be. Sometimes we sort of say, well, I've asked God, and he didn't give me it. But actually, the Bible says that if we are praying and we really care and it really matters, we will keep praying. We will keep asking. Just like children will keep asking a parent. And the Bible says, if, you, if, you, if you'll do that for authorities or or, or folk that are distant or folk that don't owe you anything, how much more should you keep asking if it's a heavenly father that you know is loving? Is our prayer shameless in its audacity as it comes and asks God for the things that we need? The woman comes and asks, and Jesus responds by saying, we don't give the children's bread to dogs. Now, here's the interesting thing here. We'll come back to what Jesus is doing that for in a moment. But it does seem to be saying, my priority are the Jewish people. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, you know, my mission is to the children of Israel. Right now, that's my priority, not, not, not the Gentiles. That will come later. And the woman could have been outraged at this point. I guess we might have been outraged. That you can't treat me like this. This is racist. This is unfair. This is discriminatory. I have rights. My children are just as important as their children. You know, she could have got into that unbridged place of, I demand this. I have a right to this. But no, she doesn't do that at all. Rather, she says, give me the crumbs and that will be enough. Let me sit under the table and have what the children don't want because they're throwing it away. And Jesus responds by saying to that woman, bingo. You've got it. Because what has happened here, and I'll explain why in a second, is that that woman at that point has understood something that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the people in the chapter before that were fighting with Jesus had not grasped. She'd understood the nature of what God was doing in the gospel. That's why he talks about her faith that's beyond all the things that could be expected. She has understood the gospel. You see, there are two things that prevent people coming and receiving all that God is offering in Jesus Christ. And one is 
pride and the other is despair. You see, pride comes when we say, I am owed, God should be good to me, I have rights. And that's our world today, it teaches us we're entitled. We have an expectation, we should get our way. And religiously, that often means, and, and it's particularly true of people who go to church, that we think, well, you know, I go to church. Most people don't do that. God owes me something. Now, we, we know that's not true, but we sort of believe it. I, I know I sometimes think that way. Well, you know, we've got to look after me after all. I've done, look what I've done. And that pride prevents us understanding what, what God is doing because we think it's about me and the stuff I do. The problem with that is that either, when you, when you think like that, you'll either become one of those religious people who thinks you should get it because you're better than everybody else, or you'll become someone who is never secure in God's love because you'll always wonder, have you done enough? Because you've made it all about you. And that's what religion does. It's not what the gospel does. The gospel says it's about the goodness and the grace of God. The other side of that is we can get hopeless. And the hopeless person just says, well, I'm useless. I'm worthless. Nobody will care about me. God will never change my life. God will never give me grace because I've done X, Y, and Z, and it's just hopeless, and that's who I am, and there is nothing for me. But what the hopeless person is actually saying is not, I'm entitled. They're actually saying, God cannot do it for me. God is not loving enough. God is not powerful enough that he could transform me. Do you ever look at your own life and think it can't change? You know, I'm just stuck at who I am. Just have to accept it. Do you realize when you do that, what you're actually saying is God can't? But this woman grasps both sides of this. There's a context to this as well. And the context to it lies back in the previous chapter in the feeding of the 5,000. Remember the story? Jesus comes and he sees the crowd and they're hungry and he says to the disciples, we need to give them something to eat. And the disciples say, first of all, we don't have anything. Then they say it would cost too much money. Uh, they don't have anything. And they've all got five loaves. Send them away. It's hopeless. And Jesus says, no, sit them down and I'll feed them. And we're told not just that they got enough food that they sort of survived after that. We're told that they got enough that everybody, 5,000 of them, was satisfied. And then we get a little detail that they went round and collected all the scraps. See, Jesus was into recycling. They collected all the scraps and there were 12 baskets left over. Now, why are we told that? And I think we're told that because what we're being told here is not just that God can give what is needed to the people who need it. It is that God has got so much, so much generosity that He will flood with His resources more than we ever need. It's the same with the wedding of Cana, where we're told that it wasn't just that they got wine that Jesus produced. He produced the best wine possible on loads and loads and loads of it, 12 big baskets of it, 12 big chubs of it. It kept coming. It's like one of these feasts that we have with the social team next door where there's you know, baking you ask for and you get 10 times the amount of baking that you need. It's that level of, of, of God's generosity, and that's what this woman has grasped here. She's grasped that it's not a case of saying, well, could I have a few crumbs? She's grasped that the crumbs that will fall from this table, like the scraps that are left over, like the 12 baskets that are left over at the end of the, the meal, are more than enough. It's not about my right and my entitlement to sit at the table. It's, look, even if I'm at the back of the queue in the back of the table, God's grace is sufficient that it will never lack. And that's not a sense of entitlement. That's not a, I'm worthy and I should receive it. It's saying, no, I can be unworthy and I can sit and know my place and still God's love is enough for me. 
And so this woman grasps the gospel. And the gospel is this. You are more wicked, more broken than you ever realized. And you are more loved than you ever dreamt. When you have both of those things, you have liberation. Because you realize that God knows you in every part of your weakness. And that's not what it's about. But God meets you in every part of his love. And nothing you do can change that at all. That is what the cross is all about. It is what the gospel is all about. We come to Jesus, and as we, as we come to Jesus in the gospels, we realize two things. The more we look at his love and his perfection and his welcome, the more we should realize our own faults and failings, but we don't despair because as we look at him, we also see his love for those who are faulty and failing as well. You know, it, it's actually a, a whole lesson in life. If you are someone who is entitled, who thinks the world owes you a living, who thinks you have worked hard and you should get it, you are always going to be dissatisfied in life. Because you're always going to feel you're owed more. You should get a pay rise. You should be treated better. You're always going to have a chip on your shoulder. But if you are somebody who sees whatever you have as a gift of the grace of God, then you will be filled with gratitude, even when you haven't got much. You know, one of the things I, I, I've learned in life is I, I've seen people who have got lots who are miserable, and I've seen people who have got nothing who are generous. And that's because they get it, that it's a gift. It's true of faith. It's true of life. It's true of the gospel itself. And by the way, it's also transformational. Remember, we, we took the gospel and we, we took it somewhere else and it went on somewhere else. Read on this story because what we find is Jesus leaves Tyre and he goes to Sidon. And again, you have to get a map out to work out where that is. But Sidon's even further north. So after he's spoken to this woman, he's going deeper into Gentile territory. And then we're told he goes to the Decapolis. Now, the Decapolis, if you were here last week, is the place where Jesus went over the lake for a few minutes and rescued a guy, took the demons out of him. The demons went into the pigs. The pigs went off the cliff. And the people there were more concerned with the pigs than everything else. It was a pretty godless place. We are told that he went to the Decapolis. And what does he do in the Decapolis? He feeds 4,000 people and there are seven baskets left over. Now, if you don't follow the story, you look at that and think, 5,000 got fed, 4,000 got fed. Is Mark told the same story twice? like the minister that repeats himself. But actually, it's not that. Because the first feeding was for the children of Israel, and the second feeding was for those that they would have called the Gentile dogs. The grace of God that just keeps overflowing. And that, we will see in the gospel at the end of it, as Jesus says, go to all the nations and baptize them. This grace that has begun where I am at is gone into all the world. And the disciples, they will have to learn that they have experienced grace in their own brokenness, and they will have to learn then that that grace is something that they are to take into all the world too. That's why shortly we're going to come to this table. This table is a place of humility and a place of joy. Because it says that we are broken and sinful and we need God's forgiveness. We need His Son to die on the cross for us. And it says that's exactly what He did. You come because you acknowledge that you are more broken than you ever imagined. And you are more loved than you ever hoped for. Archbishop Cranmer when he wrote the Church of England's liturgy all those years ago, I've missed some of these slides, never mind, wrote this. 
We do not presume to come to this table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. And so he lifts us from those who deserve to be under the table and sits us at the table of his son. Amen. Let's sing Rock of Ages. Junior Church coming back in. They are. I think Junior Church were intending on coming back in, and we will wait for the children, which is a very humbling thing to do and a good thing to do.
we're all here now, I think. There's something very appropriate about the adults waiting for the children. It's good. Thank you for coming. You are all welcome here. We are all welcome here, not because we are good enough, but because we know we are not. We are welcome here because we are loved so much that Jesus Christ died for us and welcomed us and invited us to know his benefits in his death and resurrection. As the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. So we take these elements of bread and wine to be set apart from all common uses to this holy use and mystery. And as he gave thanks, let us draw to God and offer him our thanks. Let us pray. The Lord be here in this place and with you. We come and we come to this thanksgiving because it's not just our duty, but also our joy to give you thanks, our Father. You are almighty and eternal. You are majestic and full of glory. And we thank you for the wonder of your works and for the riches of your grace. The song that we offer from our hearts and on our lips is the song of the whole church. It's the song of heaven and earth, praising you for your goodness. And so, as the angel said, holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise you for Jesus for his birth, for his perfect life on earth, for his suffering for us, for his triumph over death, for his ascension to your right hand, for the gift of your Holy Spirit and the promise of coming again. We come here today remembering what he did for us and pleading before you that eternal sacrifice that he made for us And following his example and obeying his command, who in the night he was betrayed, took bread and after giving thanks, broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembering me. And in the same way, took the cup after supper and said, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in memory of me. And so, Lord, we ask that right now you'd send your Holy Spirit on us. Bless us that these things that we eat of bread and wine might be for us a link in communion with the body of Christ. And the cup of blessing might be a link and a communion in the blood of Christ. That as we receive them by faith, we might be taking all that you have offered us, nourishing us and helping us grow in grace to the glory of your name. And so we offer ourselves as we do this as a living sacrifice for you in Jesus. Through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Now, according to Jesus' command, we do as he showed us what to do, and commanded us to do. And the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this is the new promise sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in memory of me. So take and eat. These are the things of God, and they are for the people of God. Amen.
peace of the Lord Jesus be yours. Let's just turn to the people around us and share the peace, shall we? The peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Sing our closing song as we go with joy. Oh, happy day. Now go from here rejoicing, and the blessing of God the Father, the God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be yours this day and forever.